Sup chooms, how y'all living? Hope everybody gets Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, I don't need to tell you chooms that low dose oral minoxidil for hair loss has been growing in popularity over the last few years and that's despite the fact that oral minoxidil can cause serious heart problems even when taken at a very low dose. And I made several videos on this subject that I'll link below. However, Nothing did more to increase the demand for low-dose oral minoxidil than this article from the New York Times published on August 18th of 2022. This article, it was basically just a shill advertisement for oral minoxidil, presenting only the positives and not mentioning at all any of the negatives, like the risk of cardiac side effects. Of course, the article told the hair loss community what they wanted to hear, so they all accepted it without any skepticism whatsoever, and now oral minoxidil has become mainstream enough to the point where even telehealth companies are now selling it. I went over this terrible New York Times article in a video that I'll link below. Well, it turns out we now have hard evidence that this New York Times article did directly cause a marked increase in the number of oral minoxidil prescriptions written. Here is the headline that appeared on the website Medscape, and this article is based on a recent study titled, quote, Changes in Minoxidil Prescribing After Media Attention About Oral Use for Hair Loss, unquote. The study looked at the number of first-time prescriptions written for oral minoxidil before and after the publication of the New York Times article. The data comes from a large electronic prescription data database from eight different health systems across 13 American states. As you can clearly see in this graph here, there was a huge spike in new oral minoxidil prescriptions right after the article was published, and the number of new prescriptions has remained high compared with the number of prescriptions before the article was written. As sort of a control group, the article also looked at new finasteride prescriptions and new prescriptions of high blood pressure medications during the same time period. There was absolutely no change in the frequency of those prescriptions, which proves that it was the New York Times article specifically that caused this massive bump in oral minoxidil prescriptions. This all shows the tremendous power of the mainstream media to influence opinions and to encourage both patients and doctors to change their practice. The article had this result even though it did not reveal any new data or studies on low-dose oral minoxidil whatsoever. It was basically just some quotes from dermatologists who promote using low-dose oral minoxidil in their practice. That's it. There was nothing new in the New York Times article. Instead, it put a real positive spin on oral minoxidil for hair loss while ignoring the very well-documented dangers of the drug. Yet, despite this article telling us nothing new, it managed to cause a big increase in oral minoxidil prescriptions, which is not great news at all here at Chooms. Unfortunately, contrary to popular belief, oral minoxidil can indeed cause very serious cardiac complications. The most serious of these cardiac problems is a condition called pericardial effusion, which means fluid accumulation around the heart. This sack of fluid around the heart can compress the heart, which is called cardiac tamponade, and that can actually be fatal if emergency surgery isn't performed to drain the heart of fluids. These potentially lethal effects are the reason that topical minoxidil was originally developed and FDA approved for the treatment of hair loss. This was a good move because despite its decades of use, these deadly cardiac side effects, specifically pericardial fusion, have never been reported with topical minoxidil use. These serious complications were frequently reported very soon after oral minoxidil was first introduced to the market back into the 1980s. But many dermatologists today, like Dr. Gary Linkov, The Hair Loss Show, and Dr. Oscar Muniz have dismissed these dangers by baselessly claiming that these dangers like pericardial effusion can only happen when high doses of oral minoxidil are used. However, this claim was officially disproven last year when a case report was published that described a woman who developed a pericardial effusion three weeks after starting just 0.25 milligrams daily of oral minoxidil. I made a video on this case where I not only went over the case, but also discussed the flaws in the methodology of existing oral minoxidil research last month. For example, in this widely quoted study that looked at side effects in 1,404 patients on low-dose oral minoxidil, only people who had already been on minoxidil for at least three months were included. Since this was a retrospective data analysis, someone like the woman reported in the case report who developed a pericardial effusion after only three weeks of oral minoxidil use would not even have been included in the study. So, retrospective studies cannot resolve the issue of how safe low-dose oral minoxidil is, even though studies like this one are cited by low-dose oral minoxidil supporters as proof that the drug is safe all the time. Anyways, Dr. Oscar Muniz, who is one of the biggest online pushers of oral minoxidil, objected to this case report of pericardial effusion on low-dose oral minoxidil by claiming without evidence that since the oral minoxidil came from South Africa, that somehow they screwed up the dose of it, and it wasn't really 0.25 milligrams per day. 
I did a community post on that recently. To summarize that post, it is clear that Dr. Muniz is just speculating without evidence that the South Africans didn't formulate the oral minoxidil correctly because it apparently isn't sold legitimately in that country. However, even if we were to accept that argument, the dose could still have been 10 times higher, and that would be a dose of only 2.5 milligrams per day, which is still considered low-dose oral minoxidil by virtually every dermatologist who is hyping the drug up today. What's even worse for this argument, though, is that even if you were to throw out that case report entirely, there is still another case report of pericardial effusion in a subject on 1.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil a day, published by Dr. Truip, who is one of the most renowned and respected dermatologists and hair loss researchers in the entire world, not to mention the Morden Solis scientist Solarian of the hair loss industry. Dr. Trubb doesn't live in South Africa. He lives in Switzerland. So maybe Dr. Muniz would like to try making the case that they don't know how to prepare oral minoxidil in Switzerland too. Or maybe Dr. Muniz should just stop grasping for straws and admit that oral minoxidil's dangers are idiosyncratic, meaning that its most dangerous side effects are not dose dependent. In reality, there is no way to predict who will get cardiac side effects from oral minoxidil in the minimum blood level that can cause these problems is unknown. It does appear, though, that due to the rapid absorption of oral minoxidil through the gut, the serum levels of minoxidil that occur with even low-dose oral minoxidil are still enough to cause pericardial effusion in some patients, while on the other hand, the very low and steady serum levels of minoxidil that occur with topical minoxidil have never been associated with cases of this serious complication, despite decades of use by millions of patients. So, even if you have objections to those two case reports of pericardial complications from low-dose oral minoxidil that I have already mentioned, it turns out there is yet another case report published just last year that I just came across. That's right, we now have a third case report of low-dose oral minoxidil causing serious heart problems that, unsurprisingly, was published shortly after the New York Times shitty article on oral minoxidil, which is increasingly making the New York Times about as relevant as the Epoch Times or Infowars. In this case report, a 52-year-old man was given 2.5 milligrams daily of oral minoxidil for androgenic alopecia. Keep in mind, this is still considered just a low dose of oral minoxidil, and in fact, I often see dermatologists claim that 5 milligrams is a low dose of oral minoxidil. After just two weeks, he developed chest pain. So again, like with the other cases, this guy would not have even qualified for inclusion in the study of 1,404 subjects on oral minoxidil since his side effects started before he had been on minoxidil for three months, which if you remember, Remember, was an inclusion criterion for the study. It's becoming clearer and clearer how useless that study of 1,404 subjects actually is. Anyways, in this new case report, the subject's lab test showed evidence of general inflammation. His electrocardiogram was abnormal and was consistent with inflammation of the pericardium of the heart. He did not actually develop fluid around his heart, but he clearly had inflammation surrounding the heart, which is called pericarditis. Pericarditis causes severe chest pain, and if untreated, it often leads to pericardial effusion and even cardiac tamponade. He was put on anti-inflammatory drugs, and the minoxidil was stopped. All his symptoms resolved a week after stopping minoxidil. Without medical intervention, there is a very good chance his symptoms would have progressed, and again, this is a condition that can sometimes be fatal. The authors of this third case report of serious pericardial complications of low-dose oral minoxidil conclude their study by saying, quote, the optimal dosages to avoid these adverse effects are currently unknown, considering they have now been observed in even low-dose formulations. Owing to the seriousness of these cardiac complications, we emphasize the need for caution when prescribing low-dose oral minoxidil, particularly for patients with high-risk medical histories." Unquote. I don't have much to add to that, as it is pretty self-explanatory. We now have three case reports of serious cardiac events happening with people on doses of oral minoxidil, ranging as low from 0.25 milligrams daily to 2.5 milligrams daily daily, so I think we can now definitively say that low-dose oral minoxidil has the same problems that higher-dose oral minoxidil has. Namely, it can cause pericardial inflammation and potentially life-threatening cardiac complications. Now, I know some of you may dismiss this by saying, oh yeah, Kevin, well that's just three case reports, so haha. -ha. You have to remember, though, that publishers don't usually keep publishing the same type of case report over and over again. The fact that a side effect is published in just one or two case reports is enough to indicate that the side effect definitely can occur. Unfortunately, the New York Times advertisement masquerading as journalism on oral minoxidil has only made this situation worse since prescriptions of oral minoxidil have increased exponentially since this article was published. At the 
same time, there have fortunately been no case reports of topical minoxidil causing pericarditis or pericardial effusion. This is despite decades of use in possibly millions of people. I mean, it is an over-the-counter drug, after all, that requires no prescription. As to why there is a difference between topical and oral minoxidil, like I mentioned, it probably has to do with the fact that the absorption of topical minoxidil is very slow, while oral minoxidil is, is absorbed very quickly from the gut. Thus, with oral minoxidil, there are much higher blood level peaks that are higher than what happens with topical minoxidil usage. So, I feel obliged on my channel to warn people about this, and I'll continue to do so until we have large perspective studies showing that low-dose oral minoxidil is safe. I don't think that is going to happen, though, since so far, based on the current research, the opposite has been shown. Unfortunately, the New York Times article last year just added to the problem, and now there are even more people taking low-dose oral minoxidil for hair loss, and that's despite the fact that most dermatologists are not trained to diagnose cardiac problems caused by this drug. Like I said, I have made numerous videos on this subject, and I encourage you to all watch them before deciding whether or not to use oral minoxidil. I feel that the risk of oral minoxidil have been greatly downplayed by the hair loss community at large, as well as by dermatologists who are not qualified to monitor and understand drugs that have significant cardiovascular risk. Most dermatologists, at least in the United States, have at most just one year of internal medicine training, so they are not qualified to read electrocardiograms or to diagnose and treat serious cardiac conditions like pericarditis and pericardial effusion. I have also noticed that many of the people who are pro-oral minoxidil are also anti-finasteride, which would explain why they develop such an emotional attachment to it, so much so that I get attacked personally by the hair loss community every time I make a video on oral minoxidil. You see... There is a very sizable portion of hair loss sufferers who are just going to be too dickless to use finasteride no matter what, and no amount of evidence will ever convince them that it is safe. So, now they hear a bunch of doctors telling them that they can use oral minoxidil, and they're of course extremely happy because they now think that this is their ticket out of having to use a 5AR inhibitor for hair loss, but the truth is, this is pure cope and they are absolutely kidding themselves. Not only are they wrong about oral minoxidil being safe, they're also wrong that it will be an effective long-term treatment for stopping hair loss. Oral minoxidil, unlike finasteride, is just a non-specific growth stimulant that won't do anything to target the root cause of hair loss, which of course is the trash hormone DHT. Even the study of 1,404 subjects that they love to bring up every time their sacred drug is attacked online admits that the side effects are frequent, with 15% of people getting hypertrichosis, which is unwanted hair growth, as well as cases of fluid retention and rapid heart rate from the drug. So, Using oral minoxidil will buy you some time, but in the end, you'll still lose your scalp hair while growing a massive amount of hair all over your back, feet, hands, and buttholes, which will make you look like Jason Blaha. And that is assuming you even live long enough before oral minoxidil blows your heart to smithereens. Look, Chooms, I know topical minoxidil can sometimes be a pain, and not everybody is going to be a responder to it, but there are ways to get around that, such as using a higher concentration of topical minoxidil, such as 10 or 15%, or by using a compound like tretinoin to upregulate the enzyme which converts minoxidil into its active form. I have made videos discussing both of these methods, which I'll link below, but the bottom line here is that nobody has to use oral minoxidil to save their hair. People use it because they want to, not because they have to. Also, topical minoxidil isn't even that inconvenient since you only really need to apply it once per day in order for it to be effective. The twice per day recommendation is based on outdated information and more recent data proves that once a day use is adequate, and I'll post my video discussing that below. So please, Chums, I know that the temptation to just take a pill and be done with it is very tempting, but the risks are simply not worth it. Your heart is fragile. That is why heart-related diseases account for the majority of deaths worldwide. With all the external and genetic factors that can adversely affect your heart, you don't need to risk it any further every day by taking an obsolete blood pressure medication that is virtually never prescribed anymore by cardiologists due to its well-documented dangers. Of course, that is just my advice, take it or leave it, but hopefully this helped you all better understand why I do not feel comfortable promoting this drug on my channel. So, I'll see you all next time, Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.